Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, Ethereum 3.0 and uh, specifically uh, quantum security, which is the, the main focus of Ethereum 3.0. So we want to try and protect ourselves against uh, better versions of these uh, machines here. That's, uh... Okay, so I'm going to give a quick intro and then uh, the talk will be organized in three, three parts. One, basically talking about if one uh, today and how it's vulnerable to qu quantum computers, and then uh, if two, kind of baby steps uh, towards uh, protecting ourselves against quantum computers, and if um, 3.0 eventually uh, reaching quantum security. So, um, you know, this is kind of the, the high level of uh, progression in the blockchain space. Uh, we've had, you know, good reasons to to move to a new system, and I. You know, it's, I believe that quantum security uh, will be a, kind of a, a very good reason uh, to move uh, to, to, from ETH2 to, to, to ETH3 to do the upgrade. It might, might even be something that the Bitcoin people would agree with as well. Okay, so I guess um, in quantum computing you have um, uh, Neven's law, which is kind of the, the equivalent of, of Moore's law. Um, and it says that computational power uh, kind of grows doubly exponentially, so it's kind of even stronger than uh, than, than, than Moore's law. Um, and you know, there's also a, a bunch of people who think that you know quantum computers are hype and they'll never be scalable. And you know, right now we're at this point where the line is flat, so it's very difficult to tell. But it is possible that at one point, you know, things will shoot up, and you know, we have to be conservative. Uh, we have to assume the worst-case scenario, and so you know, we're going to just assume that Neven's law will, will hold. So, um. Okay, so what is, the, what is the narrative that we have? Well, um, basically the narrative is we'll have Ethereum 3.0, it's going to be a quantum secure upgrade, and there's going to be stocks, stocks, and lots of stocks. Um, and why stocks? Uh, well, one is that it's kind of a, a flexible construction, it's kind of one tool to rule them all. You can do uh, pretty much everything with them that we're interested in. Um, it's kind of the lean and resilient uh, cryptography, you know, consolidation of assumptions, you know, mo mostly building on, uh, only building on hash functions, and then they're also, um, as we've mentioned this morning, are quite old, so you have the, the Lindy effect. And also the, uh, the performance is, 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 is good. So the, they have relatively fast provers, and you know, the, the, the major downside is that the, the, the proofs are, are large, but as I'll try to argue later on, data is cheap. So this is not a problem for us, especially in the longer term. Okay, so, um, you know, we want to protect ourselves against compu quantum computers in the long term, so let's make some investments, and um, basically we, we made this, this uh, large grant, and the goal was to... Um, one, try and introduce uh, stock-friendly hash functions because with the current hash functions that we have, like SHA-256 or even Blake or, or SHA-3, they're very much um, uh, difficult to work with. And, uh, you know, we want to try and come to a point where everyone uses the same hash function um, as a common building block um, to try and, and encourage network effects and things like that. And also encourage more... more um, more uh, more review uh, of, of, of the, the one specific hash function that we're building upon. And there's a big focus in the grant on performance. So actually part, part of the money is like performance bounties. So the, the, the faster you can go, um, the better. Um, and there's also a huge focus on open source. So, you know, we want all the code that is released to be released, for example, under the MIT license or some other similar license. And we also want um, kind of lots of third-party audits uh, and, and, and review. And so all of this is part of kind of moving towards production uh, readiness for, you know, potentially powering Ethereum 3.0 and it, it, there could be, you know, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars at stake. Okay, so when we make the when we made the grant, um, stocks were only plausibly quantum secure. But um, you know, quite very recently, um, Alessandro and, and, and his team um, basically came up with uh, with a proof that actually they are you know quantum secure. Um, one of the downsides here is that the, the proofs are slightly larger. So they're already large; they're getting larger. If you want to protect yourself against uh, a quantum attacker in that specific model. And um, 
I've tried to ask a few people what the concrete constant is, like by how much the proofs are going to increase, and I still don't have a satisfactory answer, but um, it's, it's expected to be a small uh, constant, maybe on the order of, of One. two. One? <laughs> okay, I think it's more like two, but we'll see. I could be wrong. Um, okay, and you know wh when when we when we made the grant as well, there was like stocks had this this fantastic property of universality, um, and I'd say maybe this is not so much of a competitive differentiator nowadays. Because now we have lots of options with all sorts of different trade-offs if you want universality. Um, so you know stocks fall in the the, the first uh, category where the, the setup is just just a hash function. You just need to choose your hash function. But now there's all sorts of other setups: class groups, RSA groups, powers of tau, and they all have different trade-offs. Um, so you know the the one unique selling point of stocks in you know, in this framework is the quantum security. Um, and you know this is kind of a confirmation that picking stocks for quantum security is a was a was a good decision. Okay. So, where are we right now with, with ETH1? So, um, okay, this is not ETH1, this is Bitcoin, but uh, uh, Peter from uh, Bitcoin says, 30% of the Bitcoin supply is at risk of a quantum computer. So he, you know, he, had, he, he looked at the available public keys and he, he, did, he, he did some statistics. And um, yeah, basically the, the reason is that if you have um, if you reuse an address and the, the public key is known, then the, a quantum computer could, uh, could could you know recover uh, the private key and then and then your your funds would be at risk. And you know I'm kind of expecting actually that the situation on if one is worse than thirty seven percent, partly because kind of ac the the account model might encourage more uh, reuse than the UTXO model. But I I don't know the. I don't have a number to share. Um, and you know, another complication in ETH1 is that uh, contracts might be kind of really hard to migrate. So if you think, for example, of a, a long-running auger bet, you know, that's that's meant to last 20 years or 30 years. Um, I, I don't know how to, to, to address these um, these contracts. Um, and you know, one option is to do some sort of governance intervention where we say, you know, if, if the worst comes to the worst. Uh, and we see like really old addresses be becoming attacked. Um, you know, we could say any any funds that are you know let's say at least ten years old and haven't been touched um, will just uh, burn them. But then, you know, this is not great because there'll be false positives. They'll be controversial, and it's it's not something um, that we want to you know encourage. There's also you know the problem of in in inertia. So we're we're here today in the quote, vulnerable position relative to maybe 10, 20 years in the future. And the current public key infrastructure that we, the, you know, took, took, you know, two decades to set up. So uh, I guess starting to, to think about it today and acting now is, is, is a good uh, hedge. And, you know, just to give you an idea of the time frames involved, if you look at, for example, the NIST post-quantum security uh, competition, um, you know, which some people argue was started too early, uh, because it you know it didn't include some of the more uh, recent constructions that still kind of is you know stretches uh, many many years and in the context of blockchains there's you know additional friction to doing updates you know related to governance and things like that okay so this is this is my point uh, you know da data is cheap um, and basically the idea here is that you have uh, Nielsen's law which says that uh, bandwidth will grow 50% uh, every year, and that's kind of consumer bandwidth, uh, which is fantastic, and especially good for for snarks. Uh, and you know, one of the reasons why you, you know we have this is that like data is very easy to work with. Like data is fungible; a byte is equivalent to any other byte. Um, you know, so you can you can do lots of parallelization. And you know, if you take a 200 kilobyte stock proof today, that would only be the equivalent of 3.5 kilobytes uh, in 10 years. So that's that's great news. Um, and so one of the things that we have done in ETH1 is kind of take this into account. So, so ETH1 is already five years old, and so there's five years of Nielsen's law that has kind of accumulated. And so 
a little adjustment was, was due. And so we have this EIP 2028, which says, if you want to put data on the blockchain, you only need to pay 16 gas per byte as opposed to 67 gas per byte. Um, and like w one of the, the characteristics of hardware is that computation is actually no longer scaling. So even though Moore's law is still technically true, you know, you still have a doubling of transistors per unit area, the computational gains are, are not following Moore's law. And you know, one of the reasons is that um, you know, power, power density is, is so high that you, know, you, would, you would melt the chips if you try and, and, and push more performance. And so you have a, a plateauing of the sequential of the computation, and this, this, this chart kind of shows the sequential computation relative to Nielsen's law, which kind of shoots up. So my prediction is that we'll see more data repricings uh, in the future, and we could even have a kind of automatic repricing over time, where the the cost uh, of data just decays automatically over time. Okay, so. Uh, if to what are, what are we doing relative to um, um, quantum computers? And it turns out we're doing kind of a, a bunch of things, and I'll just kind of go through them. So one interesting thing is that we have this kind of emergency post-quantum apocalypse um, you know, infrastructure. And the idea here is that <clears throat> you have the, the traditional uh, key infrastructure based on you know, BLS, uh, which is not post-quantum secure. And if, if you know, a quantum computer comes up, we can just cancel all of this and use the backup infrastructure. And this is kind of, the analogy is similar to the, um, so this image here is the, the, the Svalbard um, global seed vault. Uh, basically, it's a place in the world where there's seeds, agricultural seeds from all over the world, um, and that's kind of a, a backup in case, for example, of an atomic apocalypse. You can kind of recreate uh, humanity, and that's kind of the same idea here. And so what we're doing is we're using lamp port signatures as a backup. And, it, and the cool thing about the construction, which I'll show uh, soon, is that it's, it's backwards compatible. So it can be integrated with any existing signature scheme you know, on Bitcoin, on ETH1, anywhere. And the way that it works is, is like this. So basically, you have your seed that you use to generate lamp port uh, secret key and the public key. And then you hash the public key, and then you get your traditional non-quantum secure, non secure signature scheme. And, <clears throat> and then you, you, you kind of use that as normal. And then if you know, the worst comes to the worst, and you have to discard the right part, then you can just you know, reveal the Lampold public key and show that it matches the, the non-quantum public key. And this, the, you know, this hash is, is, is quantum secure. And then you can just use your, you know, your Lampold uh, secret key to do a, a, a one-time signature to migrate onto, the new, onto a new platform. So what we would do, like in practice, if we have to use this, is we'd shut down EVE 2. And then when EVE 3 is ready, we'd have a transition mechanism for validators and users to, uh, to migrate to the new system. Okay, and just just so that for those who don't know uh, Lamport signatures, which might be very few of you, it's so simple that I'll, I'll just show it. So basically you have um, your secret key, which is just um, 32 byte uh, numbers, and you have um, two times 256 of them. So the idea is when you want to sign a message, you sign the, the hash of it, which has 256 bits. Each bit can have two, two values, so that's why you have the a and the B. You, you, your public key will be the kind of the, the hashes of the A's and the B's. And then, you know, if, if the, the, the message that you're trying to sign has a, in a specific bit position has a zero, then you reveal the, the A, and if it has a one, you reveal the B, and, and that's the signature. Very nice. Okay, so second idea in if 2 is uh, multi-hashing. So, um, <clears throat> We kind of want to encourage uh, applications to, uh, to to read the the, the, the Ethereum uh, a blockchain, and uh, <clears throat> we 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 want to encourage people to do it in a way which is uh, friendly to, to zero knowledge proof systems. And so right now everything we do in if two is based on SHA two fifty six, which is amazing in all respects, except one respect, which is that it's not it's not stock friendly or, or snark friendly. And so 
we're putting all this effort right to try and design a you know, lower arithmetic complexity hash function which would kind of be you know inferior to shadow 56 in all respects except this 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 sha, um, this this stock friendliness and um, you know one you know traditionally you have blockchains they'll just choose a hash function and they'll run with it um, and we kind of want the best of world, both worlds and so you know why not both why can't we just use both and, the, and it turns out that we can use both and, and it's an idea called multi-hashing where basically in for example your 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 headers you know you'll have um, block hashes and you'll have your your state root and you basically compute your block hashes um, using two different hash functions and you put both in the hash function uh, and same for, for the roots and so if you're building an application which needs to read the Ethereum blockchain um, then you'll be you know you can just use which, whichever you want whichever is most appropriate so if you want like really strong security you'll just use SHA-256 or if you want speed in the plain text you'll use SHA-256 but if you want to do something more fancy with the knowledge proofs you'd use the, the, the other hash function Okay, so this is the challenge, it's already been discussed, there's all these uh, families and flavors of hash functions, looking forward to the, the, the competition and the winners, and the winner. Um, and one, one thing that I actually only realized uh, yesterday, uh, maybe it's like the Starkware has kind of changed the tactic, is that actually it, now the, the, the thinking is that the, the uh, stark friendly fields are actually prime fields, not the binary fields. Um, and you know the main requirement, as I understand, is that they have high triadicity, and so that means that we can pl plausibly design a hash function which is friendly to both Starks and the Snarks, uh, which is amazing, which is fantastic, um, and you know it's great in the context of multi-hashing because we don't need three functions; we can just use two hash functions. Um, but it's also uh, you know great in general that uh, there's this collaboration uh, possible here. Another thing that we're doing in EVE 2 is that we're making addresses longer. So right now, they're only 160 bits. And the, the, the classical pre-image resistance for that would be 80 bits. But it turns out there's, uh, uh, yes, collision. Uh, sorry, collision, yes. <laughs> Replace pre-image with a collision. Um, so there's this result from 2017 where actually you can do slightly better with a quantum computer. Um, maybe even down to, to n to n over three, and you know you need to take into account all the possible weakenings uh, that are found, and you also need to take into account that you know 80 bits of security has actually been breached in practice if you look at the Bitcoin blockchain. So um, routinely, the Bitcoin blockchain will produce block hashes with 80 leading zeros. There's more than 2,000 of them. And this is a record that has 91 uh, leading zeros. So, you know, I just avoid 80 bits of security um, going forward. And so, you know, we'd use um, kind of um, addresses which are 250 bits long. Another idea is um, kind of uh, witness compression. So what, what, what is the problem here? So basically, you know, one of the big design decisions in EVE 2 is stateless clients. So it's the idea that the validators don't store state, they only store um, kind of very, very small um, state routes. And um, that kind of means that when, when you make transactions, you need to specify the, the state yourself, the data, and you need to specify all the, the Merkle branches. And there's kind of this... Um, <coughs> This, uh, this deep nesting that's going on where you have the beacon chain, you have the shards, in the shards you have execution engines, in the execution engines you have dApps, in the dApps you have accounts. And so the, you know, we, we're basically expecting that for you know, one unit of application data you're going to have 10 units of Merkle proofs. So that's quite a big overhead uh, for, for applications. And so one, one neat idea here is the idea of witness compression. You just take all the Merkle proofs and then you, you shrink them down into a snark, for example, and you can you know, potentially get much, much lower overhead. I mean, I must say here, snarks might be more appropriate, at least in the short term, uh, because they're, they're, they're so much smaller. Another idea in if 2 
uh, I guess almost done with Eve 2 is that we're we're not opinionated on the signature scheme. So if you want to go directly to, you know, for example, a quantum secure scheme, you don't have to pay the cost of ECDSA, which uh, you know, is currently enshrined in EF1. So there's no minimum 21 gas that you need to pay for EC recovery and whatnot. Uh, you can just go straight to the to, to the quantum uh, stuff if you want. And then the final idea, which is a little crazy but still interesting, is the idea of a quantum canary. So can we um, have a special contract on the Ethereum blockchain which would uh, reward anyone who can prove that they have a quantum computer? And so, you know, that would give us kind of an early warning that we really needed to get moving and, and do a, a transition to, to something uh, secure. And we can even calibrate the problem in such a way that, um, you know, the quantum computer would not be able to fully break the system, but it, it would be kind of a, a strong warning that we need to, to get moving. And this trigger, you know, could be uh, made... Uh, <coughs> Could be made uh, invisible for for contracts, uh, not not just the the consensus. Okay, so E three, what what are the, the the kind of the parts that we need to to upgrade? So um, in in phase zero and phase one, all the parts kind of um, share this one uh, peculiarity, which they they're basically built on. Uh, on, on, on BLS signatures. Um, so we have these uh, BLS 12381 private keys and we use them for aggregate signatures, for, we use them for Randall, and we use them for um, proofs of custody. And um, one of the reasons we, we're, 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 we're leaning on um, BLS 12381 is that it's very friendly to, um, to MPC. So what we mean by that is that you can have a single validator which is actually controlled by a, a pool of different people, and they can all, you can have, for example, two or three uh, multi-sig eff effectively um, on, on all the constructions that we have in EF2. So if you want to run a validator which requires 32 EF and you don't have 32 EF, then that's one way to kind of decentralize the validator itself, which at the consensus layer is an atomic entity. And then in phase two, we uh, introduce VDS, which is a different cryptography, which is based on uh, a group of unknown order, specifically uh, an RSA group. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just uh, go through all these four and explain kind of what our, our current thinking is. So for aggregate signatures, these are the constraints that we have. So we want to... We want to batch... We want to have batches of signatures of uh, of size, uh, let's say, 1,024, and we want to have 128 batches per block, and each block comes every every six seconds. And this is kind of totally possible to do with BLS um, uh, signatures. And it's one of the, um, if not the key reason, why we're able to have so many shards. So we're 1,024 shards. A lot of, you know, the reason it's such a high number is uh, thanks to, to BLS. Um, aggregation, and so, um, you know, how how could we try and, and mimic that uh, with uh, with stocks? So one idea is just to uh, have Lamport signatures at um, at the bottom layer. We batch them into groups of uh, uh, 1,024, and then we take those those stocks and then we batch them again. So you know, wh one of the one of the things that we'd need here is is a one level of recursion uh, in the stocks, which, as far as I understand, is something that uh, that that is possible. But there is still one kind of open problem: is like, how do you have MPC friendliness? Like the Lampold signatures are not super MPC friendly, and so if that's something you want to work on, um, that, that that that'd be great. So the other kind of construction that we have is. Uh, Randall, and the idea here is that you want to have some sort of um, uh, pseudo random function that is associated to to to, an, to a validator identity. And um, you know we use BLS, but here's here's another idea which actually doesn't use these stocks at all, um, and I'll, I'll explain how it works. So the idea is that the validator has a has a seed that they uh, computed uh, locally um, at random. And then they just keep on hashing it and hashing it and hashing it. And then they commit 
to the 1024th uh, hash. And basically, you have this hash onion, and every time you want to provide a, a random kind of looking number to the blockchain, you just unpeel one layer of the hash, and you can prove that it matches the commitment, um, just because uh, the blockchain can, can, can do the, the, the hash. So you basically unpeel these layers, and like the, the reason why this uh, satisfies the MPC property that uh, we, we, we want is that it, it turns out that the hash functions that we're designing to be snark friendly are also, to a very large extent, MPC friendly. So, um, like the, a, big, a big cost in, in the MPC is, is going to be the number of rounds of communication. And uh, the, the number of rounds of communication is basically going to be the, 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 the circuit depth. Um, and, and so, you know, thankfully, the, it's quite, quite a lucky coincidence that we will be able to do this. And because um, you only need to unpeel a, a layer of the onion uh, rarely, let's say on the order of once every seven days, um, then it, it's okay to have a very small number of, of layers. Okay, so another like key construction that we have in Ethereum, and we use it to basically address the data availability problem, is the idea of a proof of custody. So the proof of custody, what it tries to achieve is that um, it wants to make sure that you have um, a, a piece of data, and you haven't kind of outsourced the the the, the downloading of the data to someone else. So. Um, you have the data, and the, the way that the, the construction works is that you, you meant to, to pick a secret. Well, there's a secret which is um, attached to your identity, and you're going to do this mixing process. So you mix the secret with the data. And so one way to do that is you have your secret, which is, let's say, 32 bytes, and then you, 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 cut, you chop the data into 32-byte pieces, and then you XOR every single piece um, with, 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 with the secret. And then you, what you can do with Starks is you, you can uh, create a Starks which says, I know the mix, so I'm basically I'm in, in, in possession of this, this mix, which is consistent with the, the hash of the data, which is what you'll be signing over, and consistent um, uh, over the, 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 the secret. Um, so, yeah, you can get proofs of custody which are kind of non-interactive. Right now in Eve 2, they're interactive, so that's a, an added kind of a, a, a bonus here. So you get both quantum security and non-interactivity. And then, kind of the, the final construction that needs to be upgraded is VDF. So instead of using um, RSA groups, we kind of use um, permutation polynomials. So, like you, you, you can imagine, um, you know, the the, the, the square function or the, the, the cube function in the, in the finite field, like the, the, it turns out there's this um, asymmetry between the polynomial and its inverse. So there's an asymmetry between taking a square root, which is computationally intensive, versus verifying that you have a square root where you only need to do a single square. And so you can use that kind of gap between the prover and the verifier to compute, to, to to basically squeeze the verific verification time relative to uh, evaluation time, and then you use uh, stocks to get this exponential gap. I'm going to move forward because I don't have much time, but the short of it is that uh, VDFs um, based on stocks have really, really good properties relative to um, RSA, especially in, in the longer term, you kind of on the 10-year the, the time scale. And I, I briefly you know, mentioned this, that as a bonus, you can use stocks to simplify the protocol. So as a design heuristic that I have is like, if cryptography doesn't work, I'll, I'll try, you know, try crypto economics. And more often than not, you will find a crypto economic solution. But here's kind of the reverse, where if cryptography does work, you want to really try and avoid the crypto economics. And the reason is that the crypto economics comes with all sorts of complications. It comes with interactivity, the, the, the security model is slightly weaker, um, and you need to worry about economic incentives. And so if you can do cryptography, it's really great. 
And there's these two other co uh, constructions, which right now are based on cryptoeconomics rather than pure cryptography. One is the data availability, and the other one is header checks. And it turns out we can do those non-interactively with, with stocks, which is fantastic. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, so I think he's asking if you have high, very high triadicity, does it make it easier to solve the discrete logarithm problem? Um, is that the question? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I mean, in practice, um, I think you don't need that high triadicity. So, like, there's, um, I think the curve used on if one right now is like 228. Thank you, Barry. And then there's BLS 1281, which is. 232, and then there's the other one, which is BDS um, 377, which is like 40, something. 40 something, yeah. So these are kind of routinely used, routinely used by snark people, um, and you know it allows you to get you know oh, billions of gates. So that's all for all practical purposes sufficient. So so long as this you know two to the 40 does not break, you know allow discrete log, then I guess you're fine. I guess it's a similar it's a similar thing, right? So it's roughly the number of gates in your circuit. Yeah, we used, I mean, we picked like uh, very large to it. Doesn't, doesn't, uh, there's no information for the street one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're our time is up. Let's thank all the speakers of the session. I think